Hey, welcome to Radio Midweek. Here we go. Hey, welcome to Escaping Babylon, where we're diving into the Bible to discover what it has to say about the end times, the apocalypse, or the day of the Lord. Jesus told us to be prepared to be waiting and to be watching. And that's what we're trying to do here is to discover what he had to say and what the other inspired writers of Scripture had to say as well. Before we jump in, as we're going through the book of Revelation right now, I want to ask a question as we get started today. Have you ever wondered or asked yourself, why did Jesus go back to heaven? We have a great story in Matthew 28 of Jesus giving some final instructions to his disciples before he was to go back to his father. In Acts 1, we see Jesus go back up to his father only to have the angels tell them, hey, he's coming back the same way he went up. Now, the Bible gives us some clues as to why he went back, and uh, at least three I want to go over today. If you know of some more, I'd love to hear from you in the comment section on that. The first one I point to is John chapter 14. This is the night before Jesus is to be arrested. He's leaving some final instructions to his disciples. In John 14, verse 2, he says, My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going back there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. So right here, Jesus tells us one of the reasons he's leaving is to go prepare a place for us. And then he tells him, and I will come back to get you so that you can be with me eternally. The next one I want to point to is a little more obscure, but it's Hebrews chapter 8. In here... The writer says, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. We talked about the temple methods and stations just a couple podcasts ago. I encourage you to go check it out. And it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. He's talking about Jesus here. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest. For there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. So here we see that Jesus is in heaven and he acts as our mediator and great high priest to the temple that is in heaven. We're going to see that temple imagery many different times in the book of Revelation. We're told in scripture, for instance, there is an enemy who constantly accuses us that Jesus' blood is our covering for the forgiveness of sins, that he broke through the veil of the heavenly sanctuary, that impossible gap and chasm that separates us between God and humankind due to our sin. He is currently sitting at the right hand of God. The third reason we see, and we'll discover this in Revelation chapter 5, which we're diving into today. What we learn in Revelation 5 is there's a scroll. It has seven seals on it. Someone has to open this scroll and break the seals in order to kick off the events of the apocalypse. And what we learn is there is only one person qualified to do that. And he is in heaven and he alone is worthy. With that, we dive into Revelation chapter 5 verse 1. It says, Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, that's God, a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. Now, about this scroll, what did we learn in Revelation chapter 5? Well, it said it had writing on both sides. And yes, it is unusual to have writing on both sides of a scroll. It can mean a lot of things, including maybe just the scroll has a lot to say. Or there's another reason, and we'll discuss that here in just a little bit. Now, the fact that it had writing on both sides doesn't mean such a thing never happened. In fact, we see that the scroll Ezekiel 8, in Ezekiel chapter 2, it too had writing on both sides. I encourage you to go check that out. It said that it was in the right hand of God. This is the side of favor and strength. We see that in multiple verses in Scripture. 
And this is where Jesus sits while awaiting his kingdom, the fulfillment of things. Now, what is this scroll? And there are various theories out there. We'll cover a couple of them at least. The, the first one, and, and maybe perhaps the most popular, is it's a will. Wills were often sealed with six or seven witnesses. When they made the will, all witnesses had to be present and place their seal in the wax or whatever it may be to help seal that document. They also all had to be present when those seals were broken after the death of the person. And if they weren't alive, then a representative of their household had to be there to attest the validity of the document. What's interesting here and why a lot of people lean towards this being a will is what we'll say is see is that this document is going to be opened by the lamb who has been slain. We'll see that in just a couple verses. So there is this arrival of a newly slaughtered lamb, a sacrifice. That's why they think that this is a will, that it brings to fulfillment God's purposes. This is the central message of Revelation, by the way. It's the most important event of all time. It's the sacrifice of the Messiah on Calvary. And this event set off a series of other events and also put the enemy on notice. Your time is short. The Messiah has won. He will rule the earth. It ensured the final triumph of God's cause and God's people over the forces that opposed them. And the point is, the cross was the pivotal moment, and all history depends on it. Everything changed at the cross. Some other ideas as to what this sealed scroll is, is many say that it's Daniel's sealed up prophecy. We see in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, it says, But you, Daniel, roll up the seal in the words of the scroll until the time of the end. So for a lot of people, they say this is the scroll that he rolled up and sealed. We don't implicitly know that from the scripture here, but it's an interesting theory nonetheless. Others say it's a deed to property, a, a legal document, in, in particular to the earth, uh, that this is Jesus reclaiming what is his. Either way, what seems clear is this is some kind of legal document. Why? Well, what we know is ancient legal documents normally were sealed by many witnesses. Six and seven was not unusual. Such documents were normally sealed shut with hot wax. They had threads that tied the, scroll, the scrolls closed. Witnesses would press their personal seals on the hot wax. It was usually from a signet ring, and it was placed in the hot wax, and it makes an impression that matches their distinctive seal, so they knew who was present, which family was represented here, and that attests that they were witnesses. Legal documents were then rolled and often folded after they were sealed with the wax, and they often, this is key, catch this, they often have descriptions on the outside as to what's inside. And you say, well, why? Well, imagine, for instance, in a library where you have all these scrolls and they're rolled up and they put them inside a shelf. How do you know what's inside the scroll? How do you know which one you're looking for and how to find it? So, yes, there was some writing on the outside of the scrolls that would indicate what the scroll was about and what was inside. That's going to be important here in just a moment as we talk about why this scroll had writing on both sides. In Revelation 5, verse 2, it says, And I saw the mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and wept because there was no one who was found worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed, and he is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. And so right away we see John is so caught up in the moment, he's weeping. He has despair. Nobody can open the scroll. But what we discover is there is one who is worthy. And the image we're given and the hints we're giving is that of a lion from Judah. Now, this comes from Genesis chapter 49, verse 9. It says, you are a lion's cub, Judah. 
You return from the prey, my son. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down like a lioness who dares to rouse him. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until he whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations will be his. What we know is Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. What a lot of people don't realize is each of the 12 tribes had symbols, often maybe animals or tents or boats, whatever it may be, all of them had a symbol to represent their tribe. They kept it on a flag. It distinguished which tribe was which when they were out in the wilderness. In many ways, you can live kind of like a mascot. For the tribe of Judah, it was a lion. The other hint it gave us is the root of David. And what we know is that the Messiah comes from the house of David. We learned that in Isaiah 11, 1, that he's anointed by spirit, 11, 2, and appointed to rule all nations with peace, multiple verses throughout Scripture. We see in Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, it says, A shoot will come from the stump of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. We've seen these verses several times as we talk about the seven spirits that are around the throne that's come up numerous times. This is where that comes from. And so the idea that the Messiah would come out of the house of Jesse was well established very early on through the prophets in the Old Testament, that he would come out of the tribe of Judah and from the stump of Jesse. That's why here we can see this points perfectly to Jesus Christ. He is the lamb who has been slaughtered. He is the one who is worthy. We see in verse 6 in Revelation 5, it says, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. It's standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. The lamb had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out to all the earth. We just talked about the seven spirits, and here they come up again. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne, and when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, because you were slain, and your blood you purchased for God. Persons from every tribe and language and people and nation, you have made them to be a kingdom and priest to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This, again, is why many scholars think Jesus is opening a will here. We see in Hebrews 9, verse 16, an explanation. It says, in the case of a will, it is necessary to prove the death of the one who has made it. Because a will is in force only when somebody has died. It never takes effect while the one who made it is living. So what the story clearly shows here is the lamb has been slain. This is why they sprinkled blood on the center of the ark once a year. He is enthroned between the cherubim, it says. All again, temple imagery. And then notice the shift of worship here. We were in chapter 4. All the worship was given to God. Everything has been directed towards Almighty God. Now the 24 elders and those in heaven are worshiping Jesus, the Lamb who has been slain. They fall down before him. And so if there's ever any question out there, should we be worshiping Jesus? The answer is absolutely. They worship him in heaven. They all fell down before the Lamb. And so let me ask you a similar question I asked last week. When's the last time you fell down on your knees and bowed before the Lamb of God to tell him how thankful you are with a heart of gratitude, declare his worthiness to all who would worship him? It says that he had seven horns and eyes. We've spoken about this numerous times already, and Scripture tells us what that means. We have the golden bowls of incense here. And so, again, temple imagery, it's representative of the altar of incense, which is right before the Holy of Holies and the temple. It's where prayers are lifted up before God. And it's just an amazing reminder that isn't it 
amazing that our prayers are lifted up. They go before God. Your prayers matter. They are heard and they are presented to God. And what do they declare to Jesus? The greatest cry of worship. You are worthy. Only Jesus is worthy enough to open the seals. Why? Because he was slain, it says, because he was the perfect, pure sacrifice. He tore through the veil. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He is the mediator between us and God. Nobody comes to the Father but by him. He purchased us, which always reminds me of what I call my ministry life verse, the ministry that always centers me and reminds me of what it means to be a pastor, what it means to be a minister. And that verse is in Acts 20, 28. Paul says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his blood. Whose church is it? It's Jesus's. Why? He purchased it with his blood. Oh, what a price he paid to create a people and a movement that would represent his name in the world. May we never take it for granted. He is worthy. And then notice what it says there. He made us a kingdom of priests. Now, what is a priest? A priest is a person who represents God to the people and the people to God. They too are a mediator. Now, this goes back to the original calling of Israel when they are at Mount Sinai. God is to present them with the covenant, and he has some terms, some things they need to know. And one of the things he told them is that they will be a kingdom of priests. God speaks identity into them. This is who you are. You are a kingdom of priests. You represent me to the people and the people to me. You are my lights in the world. Isaiah would remember what he said in Isaiah 61, 6. It says, you will be called priests of the Lord. You will be named ministers of our God. You will feed the wealth of nations and the riches you will boast. It's in Exodus 19, 6 that we see that original calling. God says to them, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he says, you are a chosen people a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you might declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. And notice where he says they will reign. They reign on earth. We often have these pictures of us just going up into heaven, resting, hanging out, sitting on clouds, I I don't know, doing whatever we think angels do. But the reality is, is there is work for us to do. We were created for meaning and purpose. And we were not made for heaven. The name Adam literally meant dirt man or or earth man. He was taken from the earth to rule over creation, to have dominion over the creation, and to take care of the garden. He was given stewardship. And so we see that we were created to have dominion, and that we were to be stewards of God's stuff because the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We weren't created for heaven. We were created for earth. And when this is all over, we're coming back to earth as priests of God. We continue in Revelation 5, verse 11. It says, Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands. And I'll just let you know that's fancy Greek for innumerable, can't count. And 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and in a loud voice they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them say, To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praised honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen, so be it. And the elders fell down again, and they worshipped. And here we're faced with that question over and over again. Is Jesus worthy of your worship? Do you fall down and worship him? 
Remember, this is ultimately what Revelation is about. Whom do you worship? Is it Jesus or the beast? And if Jesus is willing to die to pay the price, are you willing to pay the price? Will you die? No greater love than this, Jesus said, than those who lay down their life for a friend. Jesus called us to take up our cross and to follow him. He reminded the disciples, if the world hated me, it's going to hate you. Will you stand up strong in opposition? Who do you declare is worthy of your praise and your glory? Is it Jesus? Is it the beast? Or is it you? Who is worthy of your honor and praise? And so as we wrap up Revelation 5, a quick summary. It's a short chapter. There's a scroll. It's sealed. These seals represent conditions required for this to be opened. And that's important to remember. Nobody was worthy to open the seal except one, and that's the Lamb of God who was slain for the sins of the world. That's Jesus Christ. We learn that it's not unusual to have writing on both sides of the scroll, Oftentimes, what's written on the outside is a summary of what's inside. It's not unusual. We still do that today with books. If you pick up a book at the bookstore or somewhere else, oftentimes on the back of the book or inside the cover is a summary, an enticement of what the book is about. But if you want to learn more about the details, how it unfolds, how things happen, you have to read the entire book. And I believe that that's what's going on here. On the outside of the scroll is a summary of, about, of what's about to play out. And then once we open the scroll, the events begin to unfold. We begin to see how it plays out and what happens. Keep this in mind, because here in just a moment, we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the viewpoints, some of the things and ways that people approach the book of Revelation. And these approaches shape, distort, blur, whatever it may be, how they read it. And it's important that we wrestle with some important questions before we go any further on this, discussing the seals and then the trumpets and then the bowls. Why? Because your end times eschatology, how the story ends in your mind, affects everything in your life. If you don't believe in a final judgment or reward or punishment, your life will manifest what you believe. If you don't believe you were created with meaning and purpose by a creator, beautifully and wonderfully designed. If you believe that you're just an accident, a great cosmic nature rolled the dice and things happen to just turn out a certain way, that your life doesn't really have meaning and purpose, you're really just an animal, how will that affect how you live? If there is no promise of eternal life, then you will only live for today and you will live selfishly for yourself because after all, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world survival the fittest, and the person with the most toys wins. But if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, who will return at the end of history to judge the living and the dead, that should force you to your knees in repentance, to cry out for forgiveness, a forgiveness that is only available through the blood shed by Jesus Christ, and it is with the power of the resurrection living in our lives that we go out as lights in a world to remind people there is hope in Jesus Christ. It is a life that is meant to speak and bring glory to God. That is the mark of a Christian. And so believers from every end time camp, regardless of which one you believe, whether you're sequential or parallel, whether you're pre-trib, post-trib, mid-trib, pre-wrath, whatever it may be, all of us hold to these central truths. Jesus Christ is Lord of this earth. He is coming back again. There is an eternal destiny awaiting every single person in the world who's ever lived. Therefore, this story about Revelation, the end times, the apocalypse is deeply important. If we don't understand how the story ends, how will we allow it to shape us and how we live today? How would it change your life if you knew Jesus Christ is coming back to judge the living and the dead and that there are eternal consequences to sin? 
That's what this story is all about. Jesus Christ is coming back to take this earth because he is Lord of the earth. Next week, we'll start opening the seals. We're going to talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse. This is where things start happening and start speeding up, so don't miss out. Join us. I'm looking forward to continue diving deeper and learning more. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.